Hello, uh, welcome to the episode of Sam Conversations, uh, which is a part of the 150th birth anniversary series on Mahatma Gandhi. I'm Nirupama Sekri, and I'll be in conversation with Mr. Sudhir Chandra, who's a historian and author of the book Gandhi, An Impossible Possibility. So, Ms. Chandra, I would um, like to begin with talking about the context of lynchings that are happening. Uh, in the country, at least we are reading much more about them now. And uh, what is your reading of what, how Gandhi ji responded to, how he understood this impulse to violence, which of course we saw during 1947. Um, so tell us, you know, talk, uh, talk to us about that. You know, the context which you have in mind, that is, of lynching, is part of a larger phenomena of increasing violence in our society. And you won't be related to something which happened during partition. I would like you to convince me to take it a little farther back in time because we can talk about Gandhi only if we go farther back in time. See Gandhi comes to India in 1915 and is obliged by his political guru, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, to observe a year's public silence and see India for himself. And in 1916, Gandhi says that he would like to replicate his South African experience in India. And despite his success in South Africa, Gandhi was laughed at, ridiculed. No one believed non-violence in a, a, this large scale would be possible. So I emphasize this because people had very little faith in Gandhi's non-violence. And this is a faith which, with regard to which, there was always an ebb and tide. There would be periods when people would follow Gandhi's non-violence. And these periods would be followed by periods when they would lose faith in Gandhi's non-violence. So 1918 to 1922 is one long phase when people have faith in his non-violence. Then the civil disobedience movement, roughly 29, 31, 32. And again, around 42. And that faith was only partial because the Quit India movement was as violent as it was non-violent. So, so far as this question of non-violence is concerned, we have not really internalized Gandhi's message. And uh, even, I know that the answer is going to be a bit long, Gandhi came to, Gandhi made a startling discovery during his last days. And it's a discovery which I think deserves very serious attention not only by us as citizens, but also by scholars of Gandhi and of Ahimsa. Gandhi came to the conclusion around 47 that what he, along with him, the entire world believed was a non-violent movement, was not actually a non-violent movement. It was passive resistance. And Gandhi made a distinction between passive resistance and non-violence by saying that whereas my non-violence, or let us say the non-violence of the Satyakrati, is the non-violence of a brave man. Passive resistance is the non-violence of the weak. Which means that the weak people who felt immense violence and hatred for their foreign rulers, realizing that if they threw a little stone, the answer would come in the form of bullets. So they understood this. And according to Gandhi, they repressed their violence within themselves. And once the fear of the British was gone, at the first opportunity, this repressed violence of Indian people 
came out. And I love, like to remind you of Freud's uh, notion, a very important notion of the revenge of the repressed. Gandhi hadn't read Freud, but he was a wise man. So he understood what he was saying. Now, if you want to relate what is happening in our country today with Gandhian nonviolence and Gandhi's understanding of Indian society, then we'll have to go back to this idea of passive resistance, which was the violence of the, sorry, the non-violence of the weak. Over the years, more and more of this repressed violence is coming up. And lynching, I should imagine, is perhaps the worst form. I can't imagine a, a worse form than lynching of violence. So I hope that there can be no worse form than this. Now in Gandhian terms, oh, forget Gandhi. If we can talk of lynching in human terms, in, in, in terms of common human decency and civilization, can there ever be any defense for lynching? So we needn't invoke Gandhi to condemn lynching. There is something deeply flawed within our society, within ourselves as human beings, that such a phenomenon now is not only occurring, but also gathering force. So yes, but in terms of him being a leader and him being the leader not just of the country but of so much of the leadership during the time, what do you think they thought of policies, both social and political, to kind of, like you're saying, from inside change this, this again, this impulse to instant violence? See, it would look like I'm offering a revisionist history of Gandhi and of modern India, but that is what I'm obliged to do. When you talk of Gandhi's leadership, we have to think in terms of the leadership which is periodically ascendant. Let me repeat, 18 to 22, 29 to 32, and for a very brief period in 42. Those are the times when Gandhi is formed. When Gandhi withdraws the non-cooperation movement as a result of the violence in Chauri Chaura, I will not go into those details, almost the entire Congress leadership was up in arms against him. He said, how can you ensure that a country as vast as India, you can ever be certain of complete non-violence being observed? And they also complained that when success seemed around the corner, you have withdrawn this movement. Now, Gandhi is not interested in that kind of a success because he is thinking in larger terms. He doesn't want independence straight away, even though he talked of independence within a year at the time of launching non-cooperation movement. He, he doesn't want independence per se. He wants Indians to be qualified for it. And that is why he would say, we don't want to substitute the rule of white masters with the rule of brown masters. He is talking of Swaraj. Swaraj not in terms of independence from foreign rule, but Swaraj in terms of self-rule, where every individual is capable of exercising sufficient control and sufficient restraint upon themselves. This is Gandhi's idea of Swaraj. So, in terms of political leadership, Gandhi is actually followed only uh, periodically, spasmodically. As far as social policy is concerned, I will sound an even stronger note. So far as India's social policy is concerned, so far as India's larger policies are concerned, including economic policies, the path of development which independent India has chosen, we have not in any way followed Gandhi. You will notice that so far as Gandhi's 
social program was concerned. You know he was deeply interested in social reconstruction and he had this solid constructive program including Naitali, a different kind of education. You will notice that not a single item of Gandhi's social and economic program has been followed in independent India. It's a myth, it's an illusion that Gandhi was a great leader. Of course he was a great leader. A great leader in terms of being followed. That is an illusion. And this is an illusion which we entertain and need to entertain because we want to live with a clear conscience. We still want to have a certain belief that compared to the rest of the world, we have a certain moral capital. We possess a certain moral capital which the rest of the world doesn't possess, certainly not the developed Western world. So, so we are living under this illusion and, and we are cultivating this illusion that we have followed Gandhi, we, have, we never followed Gandhi. In politics, we followed him only spasmodically. So we can talk about many things, but not about following Gandhi. So thank you very much. Um, that was very interesting. And I hope this 150th birthday reminds us to not just, like uh, Professor Chandra said, to follow him through lip service, but actually to do, to work more towards his vision for humanity and for Indians. Thank you.